Welcome back to our study of the Psalms. We are looking at Psalm 28 today, another Psalm of David. And let's start with the first couple of verses. He says, To you, O Lord, I call my rock, be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. So the first thing we notice that David is saying here, he's calling out to God, obviously, and he's confessing that without God, he has no hope. He says, without you, I'm going to be as good as dead. I'm going to be like those who go down to the pit. And so he's asking God uh, to hear him when he calls out. He calls God his rock, right? A rock, of course, being uh, stable and immovable and solid. Uh, But he doesn't want God to ignore his request to be deaf to him. Um, He says, because if you don't answer, right, I'm in big trouble. And then he says that he's crying out for mercy, right? Verse two, hear the voice of my pleas for mercy. He, he's not presuming that he deserves whatever he's asking for from God. He's asking for God to be merciful to him. And he's, he says, he's crying out for help. And then he says, when I lift up my hands, toward your most holy sanctuary. Now, there are a couple of things we need to notice about that. One is that praying with hands lifted up is, is not unusual. We see Paul mention this in, uh, I believe it's 1 Timothy chapter 2, where he says, I want men to lift holy hands in prayer. So praying with hands uplifted or outstretched, um, that's not uh, an unusual thing. Uh, and not only that, but he says his hands are lifted toward your most holy sanctuary. In other words, he's he's stretching out his hands, as it were, lifting up his hands toward the tabernacle, toward God's dwelling place. And later when Solomon builds the temple, he's going to say in his prayer of dedication, he's going to say things like, when, when someone prays toward this temple, please hear them, right? And Daniel, in Daniel chapter 6, when The king makes a decree that no one can pray to anybody except for him. What does Daniel do? He prays anyway. We know that. But what the detail we might not have noticed is that um, he prays with a window open toward Jerusalem. Right. So he's praying toward the place where God uh, has made his his presence known, his name to dwell right uh, there in Jerusalem where um, the temple was supposed to be. Right. And where before that. Um, David had uh, brought the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant, right? So this is um, this also is not unusual in the Bible. Now, in the New Testament, it doesn't matter where we are when we pray or even which direction we're facing when we pray. Jesus made that clear in John 4 when he was talking to the woman at the well. And he said, and she was asking about the proper place for worship because Samaritans thought it was one place and Jews said it was another place. And Jesus uh, said, essentially, you know, there's coming a time, I think he said, and it's now here, when neither will you worship, you know, on this mountain or in Jerusalem or wherever, but you're going to worship the Father in spirit and truth. That's the kind of worshiper that God is is seeking. And I'm paraphrasing, kind of putting all that together. But but just suffice that to say, the location doesn't matter. And with that, we... We can say the direction doesn't matter, but in the Old Testament, right, this was something that also would not have been uncommon. Uh, Then he says, verse 3, Do not drag me off with the wicked, with the workers of evil, who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Give to them according to their work and according to the evil of their deeds. Give to them according to the work of their hands. Render them their due reward. Because they do not regard the works of the Lord or the work of his hands, he will tear them down and build them up no more. So here he's praying that God would have mercy on him, right? But he's also praying that God would judge the wicked. And notice the way he describes the wicked people he's talking about here in the middle of verse 3. They speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Now that's not saying... Um, that they're trying to be peaceable, even though, you know, in their heart, they don't love this person like they know they ought to, but they're trying. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is people who are pretending to be peaceable, peaceable while plotting evil in their hearts, right? While 
while determined to do evil to the person they're pretending to be at peace uh, with. That's the kind of thing that he's talking about. Um, so this is a this is a determined, unrepentant sort of leaning into evil and uh, being deceitfully evil, right? Being um, you know, kind of covering up your evil by looking like you're a good, nice uh, person, the kind of neighbor you'd like to have while uh, deep down you know like you are going to try to perhaps destroy these people or destroy their lives or manipulate them or take advantage of them or whatever it might be. Uh, so David is saying for this kind of person, right, he's saying, God, give them what they deserve repay them according to their works. Now that also is significant because what it means is David is not asking for a punishment that is far above and beyond what their what their crime, what their wickedness deserves. He's asking for a just punishment. Uh, like we see in, in the uh, the Old Testament law of that summed up with a, you know an eye for an eye um, and a tooth for a tooth kind of thing. Um, the purpose of that law is not to say, you know, if someone knocks out your tooth, then um, congratulations, you get to knock theirs out too. Won't that be fun? That's not the point. The point is, if someone knocks out your tooth, you only get to knock out one. You don't get to knock out 12. Right? So it's, it's meant to limit our uh, response to somebody else's sin so that it is just rather than excessive. And so what David is praying for is a just punishment, not an excessive punishment, but a just punishment for their evil. Um, and he says in verse uh, five, like they don't, they don't regard the works of the Lord or the work of his hands. Uh, and so he says, he will tear them down and build them up no more. So they have a disregard for God, what God has done, what God has created, what God has worked in the world and it's because of their disregard of God that God is going to bring judgment upon them. And that's what David's praying for. Then verse six, blessed be the Lord, he says, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exults and with my song I give thanks to him. So now David is saying, I, you know, I've been praying for God to hear me. Now he's saying, God has heard me. God is my strength and my shield. This is very similar to him saying earlier that God is his rock, right? God is his protector, his defender, his, um, you know, his uh, refuge, he says elsewhere. Um, he trusts in the Lord. God helps him. And so he rejoices. He exults. He worships God, gives thanks to him. And then finally, he says, the Lord is the strength of his people, verse 8. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. So now David's praying not only for himself, right, but also for God's people, for God to save them, for God to be a shepherd to them, to, to carry them, right, to protect them. Uh, also, he says that he is, the Lord is, the saving refuge of his anointed. Now, the anointed at the time uh, would have been David right? Uh, David was anointed as king uh, when he was a very young man, didn't become king until later after Saul's death, but he was anointed as king early on. But ultimately, the anointed one is Jesus. That's what the word Christ or Messiah means, is the anointed one. And so uh, Jesus is the one who comes from David's line, who is the ultimate anointed one. And so that's a really easy connection here in this psalm to Jesus. Uh, we know that uh, even though in one sense, David is talking about himself here, he's talking about, uh, ultimately talking about Jesus, that God would deliver, uh, be the saving refuge of Christ himself. Now, there's uh, several ways that we can connect this psalm uh, to Jesus, not only by the fact that he's the anointed one, but also that uh, when David prays, you know, if you don't help me, I, I might be like those who go down to the pit. Jesus did go down to the pit, right? Jesus did die was buried, but God raised him up. God did not leave him there. And it was intentional, right, that he died. Um, and then God, again, raised him up. Jesus also teaches a judgment according to works, like what David is praying for here. In Matthew 16, Jesus says, the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, 
and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Uh, the father heard Jesus' prayers, right? just like David is asking for God to hear his prayers. The father heard Jesus' prayers, and Jesus rejoiced in his father, just like David rejoices here. And then David prays in verse 9 for God to be the shepherd of his people, and Jesus himself is our shepherd, right? John 10, he's the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Alas, uh, how can we learn to pray uh, from this psalm? Well, it, of course, it's good to ask God to hear you, to help you. Uh, we see that over and over in the psalms. It's also okay to pray for a just judgment on the wicked. Now, of course, we want them to repent. We want them to be saved. We want them to know God. But when people are refusing to turn to God, they're refusing to repent, and they're persisting in their evil, we want it to stop. It needs to stop. And so it's right, uh, right to pray uh, that God would stop their wickedness. Uh, and one of the ways that happens is through judgment coming upon them. Um, it's good to praise God, right? When he hears and answers our prayers, uh, we don't want to just pray and ask God for things. And then when he answers, go on about our lives, we want to stop and give him thanks and, and to, to celebrate and to worship and to honor him uh, for his goodness and kindness to us. Uh, and then finally, of course, it's always uh, important to remember to pray for others as well as ourselves. David prays for himself, of course, but he also prays uh, for all of God's people. And we should learn from that example as well. God bless.